Um, in, on September, we have a visiting planned uh, where we are going to share with our neighbors um, lots of prophecies from the Bible. If we have a, a very important message in the Bible to tell everybody because we believe that Jesus is coming very soon. So in preparation for that event that we have in September, we have been studying relationships. Uh, the first three months of year 2014, we, actually you, I wasn't here, so um, you were talking about relationship with God. The following three months, we were talking about relationships among each other inside the church. And last Saturday with Pastor Lucian, we started a few months, we're going to be two, three months, we are going to talk about relationships with others, relationships with those who don't believe the same thing that we do. So that's what we are going to do. Pastor Lucian talked about service, how it was part of faith. And today we are going to talk about being heard. And let me start as a matter of introduction with something that happened to me. Many things have happened to me in my life. But this one was particularly funny. It happened in France. Um, Colonge Susalef, that's where I did my studies of theology. And um, while I was supposed to study French in Spain, I didn't have much time to study because I was um, working for the Red Cross for one year full time and doing some studies. Remember that experience I told you with the bulls? Yeah, well, that uh, robbed me from some, from some time of studies, French in particular. So here I am in France. I took with me $600 uh, for the whole amount of time I was going to be there. So I had to study during the summer to get enough for food for myself and to study during the year. And this was the first Friday. I arrived in France on Sunday, and the first Friday, I'm already hungry. I lost about 40 to 50 pounds that summer alone. So here I am. Somebody invited me to somebody's house to have some vespers. And somebody told me that this particular young lady, Laura, Laura Lautizzi, she had a car and she could probably give me a ride to the closest town to do some groceries. Now here I'm trying to think how do I approach her and ask her for that. So here I am, I go to her and what I thought I was telling her was, hey, I hear that you have a car. Can we go grocery shopping together in your car to the town? Because I'm really hungry. OK, I'm going to tell you something about French. Faire la course is go grocery shopping. Faire la cour is being romantic <laughs> and trying to have some advancement in their relationship, eventually call the parents, the whole courtship thing, right? So I said, excusez-moi, mademoiselle, est-ce que je peux faire la cour avec toi dans ta voiture? Because je faim. I told her, can I court you in your car because I'm starving? <laughs> I still remember where she was seated, where I was standing. The shape of the room, I remember the colors, the smell of my blood. I mean, I, 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 I remember everything. It was so embarrassing. 
uh, in order to say, we, we ended up being very good friends, like a really good friend. So actually it worked, but uh, not in the way that uh, I wanted. Oh, misunderstandings, language misunderstanding. I could tell you so many more stories, something involved. No, I, I won't say that. But one day I, may, I might tell you. But there is, you know, when you go to another country, there is not just the language, it's the culture. There are cultural differences. We cannot do anything about it because we have grown up all our lives in the same spot or with the same people, probably. When we go to somewhere else, there are things that go without being said that you cannot possibly know because you didn't grow up there. And you slowly start to learn them as you hit the wall. But those things are difficult to put on the books. Cultural differences are not always when we go to another country. We are in Canada. And Canada is a mix of cultures. Um, before coming to, to Canada, the only thing I knew about Canadians was what my wife told me. We are not American. <laughs> and friends, I kept saying, you Americans, I said, I'm not American, I'm Canadian. When I came here and then I went to States, I learned why that is said. But in Canada, we have a multicultural uh, richness that is amazing. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. It also gives us an opportunity to be humble when we talk to other people. For instance, shortly after arriving to Canada, arriving in Canada, there was some trash on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the ground, which is very uncommon in Canada, and I got this, and it was a newspaper printed in Canada, edited in Canada, for the Indian population, from India, the real Indians. And I go, and I read the first thing that came to my mind, I mean, to my, to my eyes, was a paragraph, an advertisement from a father saying that they were looking for a husband for her daughter, for their daughter. And there was a list of things that the daughter had, education on this, education on that, and the things that were expected. What a shock. I was so shocked. How would you ever arrange arranged a marriage? I mean, don't you want to choose the one who you love? But when you study the culture in India, it does make sense. Because in India, it's all about community. It's about family. You do want to have your family involved. You do want to live in the same huge house with different generations. It is all expected. You do want to have your children raised but not just your wife and yourself, but your uncle, your parents. It's a community affair. It's totally normal. It makes sense. That goes without being said. For us, in the Western society, we tend to be individual, individualist. It's all about us reaching our own goals, and we are proud of that. We respect that. We encourage that in our in the way we, we build our houses, it goes without being said that we value individuality and we value privacy. Both are totally fine, they are just different. Another cultural thing, for example, students. The, the, the exams that I liked the most were um, multiple choice. There's always a chance that if I don't know it, I can guess it, right? And we have all, we've all done, I mean, I've done that. I don't know if you guys have done that, but I have grown up thinking that that was okay. And we had many of those. Recently, reading a book called um, Misreading Scriptures Through Western Eyes, is talking about different cultures, and the author says that in Indonesia, where he was a missionary, he put a test to some of his students of multiple choices. Then when he collected the test, 
he saw that many people, many students, had left quite a few answers without any choice. He was shocked. When he went back to class, said, he asked, why didn't you answer those questions? Well, we didn't know them. I know, but it's multiple choice. Why didn't you choose one? And they told him, but it could it be Christian to lie. Lie? Yes, because we do not know the answer. We cannot pretend that we know the answer. Isn't that interesting? But in that culture, I guess they don't have many multiple choice exams, but in that culture, that made perfectly sense. Perfect sense. And for us, it is just, what in the world? One more example. Flags in church. We, we don't have flags in church here in this church. My first church was in College Park Church, Ashawa, near Toronto. There are big flags. There's a flag for, I don't know, it's a German region, region or for Ontario, and then there is the Canadian flag. When I first got there, I thought, what? They have flags in the church. There are many churches that have flags on the platform. When we went to the States, everybody has that. Um, they even have the, 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 the thing for the flag. How do you call that? No, the, when... <laughs> alliance. Al alliance. 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 Where is that thing? To the f I didn't write it in my notes. Can you tell that? All right. They have that, and they do that in church. And I was shocked. But, but, but you know why? The first time that I proudly held Spanish flag was when I left Spain and moved to France. Before that, I could never do that in my own country. Because many years ago, when we had a dictatorship with Francisco Franco, there was the Civil War. In the States, the Civil War was won for those who wanted the freedom. In Spain, the Civil War was won by the bad people, if you want to say. The dictator won the Civil War. Everybody that supported the dictator was hiding proudly up in the cars, well, not, probably not the cars, but on the, on, on the balconies and everything, the Spanish flag. So in my mind, in our mind, the Spanish flag has negative connotations. Isn't that weird? Isn't that sad, too? Here in Canada or down in the United States, it's a total different story. In Spain, if I put the Spanish flag on the platform, I will be disrespecting my own church because of the Spanish history. And I had to be totally fine in Canada with flags on the platform. You see where I'm going? Different cultures, different backgrounds. What do we do when we need to talk to other people that have a different background, a different history, a different culture than ours. Do we go and say, there's no way. I'm not going to have a Canadian flag in my church. You can say whatever you want. I'm going to take it off, take it out. Would that be the right thing to do? Or I should go to um, a member from Indian a background and try to, to tell her, you know, there is no way you are going to have a marriage arranged by your family. You are going to do it this way. This is how it's done. This is the best way to do. And that person might think, but no, this is how I have grown up. Are we going to, what are we going to do? There was something similar going on in, in Corinthians. You, you can open your Bibles on 1 Corinthians. Chapter 8. It talks about what happened to a church there. 
Let me tell you the background story. What happened there is that you had pagans that were being converted into Christianism. And, the, and then you had Jews that were starting to follow Jesus, or follow the gospel. Both sectors, they had sacrifices in their temples. The Jewish population, the Jewish population, where they were used to bring a lamb to the temple and do a sacrifice. That meat was eaten by the Levites, by the Levites. It was a whole tribe that was in charge of taking care of the temple. Their meat, their, their food was provided by the temple's offerings. This is one section. Then you have the other sector, the pagans. The pagans did have sacrifices as well in their temples. That, that, that meat that was sacrificed to idols. And that meat was sold to anybody who wanted to eat that meat. If you wanted to eat good meat, you would go to the temple to buy meat from there. Because they only got the best animals. When Jews went to the temple, they only got the best lamb. The pagans always brought the best animals to be sacrificed. So if you want good meat, you go there and buy it. Now, both sectors come together in Christ. And they are having this discussion. Should we eat the meat sacrificed to the idols or not? The Jewish they didn't have a problem with that. They don't have that association. But the pagans, they just left from an environment where the activities on the temple were disgusting, horrible. They were sacrificing all kinds of animals and sometimes humans too. And they wanted to get rid of that, so in their minds they cannot have that. They associated to the idols. And they have that discussion over and over. And Paul goes there and he says, listen, um, uh, verse 4. Concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. You didn't sacrifice those animals to the idols. The idols don't exist. That meat is just a normal piece of meat that you can eat. There is nothing wrong with that because there are no idols. But then he says, verse 9, But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. He is meaning... If you have knowledge and you know that there are not idols, that those things don't exist, and that meat biologically is the same kind of meat and it's clean, it's not the unclean animals, but it's a clean animal you can eat, go ahead. That knowledge gives you the liberty to choose if you want to eat it or not. But if you have that liberty, that freedom, and you try to impose it on somebody whose conscience is telling him not to do it, then you are going to be a stumbling block on that person. For anyone, if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscious of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? Verse 11, And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. And there, verse 13, my favorite and more difficult one. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. There you have a cultural issue. Totally opposite from one each other. And Paul, inspired by God, is saying, 
there is nothing wrong on one or the other. If you choose not to do it, that's fine with God. If you choose to do it, that's fine with God. What is not fine with God if is either side tries to impose that on the other person and make them sin against their conscience. We need to be sensitive to each other's conscience. We need to be sensitive to each other's culture. There are things that go without say, being said. And here, God is more interested in how we treat each other than the fact of eating or not eating that particular food. First Corinthians, just the next chapter, chapter 9, 19 to 23. I'm going to read, you can follow me if you want. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. He has a free conscience. He knows what God wants. He's not letting anybody tell him, do this or that. He's just following what Jesus said. But he still wants to, be, to become servant, make himself servant to all because he wants to win more people. He wants to make sure that more people know about Jesus. And to the Jews I became as Jew that I might win Jesus to those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. But those who are without law, as without law. And then, and then he says here, so, so before you say anything, I'm not saying I'm without the law toward God, but under the law toward Christ. So he said, I'm still with Christ. I'm not being heretic here, he's saying. But he wants to win those who are without the law. Verse 22, to the weak, I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. There is so much in here that needs to be shared with other people. There is so much in here. But in the way, the, the, the way that we approach other people is so important though. Because this beautiful book, the Bible, can be used as a weapon if we want to. We might see the biggest truth in the world that it's the simplest, the most either simple or, or, or complicated, true, anything beautiful in the Bible. But if we approach our neighbor, if we approach our friend, if we approach an, a stranger and we go with an attitude that I know more than you, you got to follow what I say because this is what it is. never been Jesus in my life, but I would hate it if somebody used my words in a way that are made not to point to Jesus, but to point at how right we are, and how my culture or how my view of saying that saying the Bible is better than yours, that attitude twists God's words and make them in a shape of a hammer. We have that within our church. We have that outside the church. I'm gonna give you a very simple example and, 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 and don't start throwing rocks to me. You'll see why I'm saying this. In France, where I studied theology, we were told over and over, over and over, do not mention 
Ellen White. That's how I grew up studying theology. Do not mention Ellen White. You can read it because it's good, but don't ever mention it. You can use it for your summer preparation, but don't ever use it. You can use it for your own personal, but don't ever use it. That's how I studied theology. That's what they told me. They told me many other things, but that stuck to my mind. Now, Europe, Western Europe, tends to be much more reserved when it comes to speaking about Ellen White. North America or Eastern Europe is totally the opposite, in my experience. So finally, during camp meeting, I bought this Bible. A Bible that I thought I would never, ever buy in my life. You know what it is? The new King James Version, which English has not been my first language, is quite difficult sometimes to read, with Alan G. White quotes. When I was in Western Europe, in France, and I heard about these things, and with what I had been taught, I was like, a, what? Putting Alan G. White quotes in the Bible? How come they do? And they are Adventists? My teacher was teaching me that, and I was, and they are Adventists? They don't see what they are doing? And I come here, I go to camp meeting, and say, I want to buy a Bible, and I ask a few people, so what's your favorite Bible? It was this one. So what I did is, you know what? When I talk with one of my members, and I know they love Ellen White, I want to be able to have a conversation with them. I want to know what Ellen White says about this as well. So I bought it, and you know what? I love it. <laughs> now, I for you to ask me something, because I know what Ellen White says about that. But you see, you see, I am Seventh-day Adventist, I am a pastor in this church, and I was taught not to use it. Different culture. Western Europe, France, very, very, very clear about that. Don't mention it. You see how that could have been a matter of tension. If we start having a dialogue here about should we, shouldn't we use it. When God inspired this lady as a prophet, and they're so beautiful, so many beautiful quotations, so many beautiful messages that we can draw from that, that all points to the Bible. Do you see that? Do you, do you see where I'm going? Now, with non-Christians, or with Christians that have another ideology than us, another way of thinking, there are also things that we need to think about. For instance, a very, very generic approach to world views, and it's not 100% true, but it's very generic, is that you have pre-modern, then you have modern, and you have post-modern. In reality, now there is a four that is coming out, but people, not many people know about that. So let's get with those three big ones. Pre-modern, modern, post-modern, post not post-modern, post-modern, I need to pronounce that correctly. Um, Pre-modern are the older people among us. They still remember what it was to be in World War II. Um, modern are the baby boomers. And post-modern no, post are the younger generation. Pre-modern, how they approach the Bible is, the Bible says so, I follow it. The pastor says so, I'll obey. <laughs> that was way long, long ago. I'll do it because that's what it is. I trust it. I don't ask questions. I follow through that. The modern is, the baby boomers is, let's prove it. Uh, that's Dwight Nelson, right? Uh, in, in, his, in his talks in, in 1995, 1996, 1998, and all those, right? He's proving the Bible. Um, 
uh, he's proving how evolu evolution cannot be true, and he's proving it through uh, uh, the Bible and through uh, the science too. That's when a, a geoscience research institute in Loma Linda started. Let's prove these things, right? That's modern. That's the baby boomers. Postmoderns is how does that affect you? You can tell me wherever you want. You can prove me wherever you want that if I don't see it in you, in your daily life, it won't do anything to me. So you have those three different, very general um, approaches to the Bible in that sense. Um, many of us, no matter what our age is, we may be one or the other. It doesn't have to be age. I can be 30. I wish I was 30. I could be 30 and still have a pre-modern type of view of the world. But when we talk with other people, it's important to know where they are at. Because if I go to a postmodern, if I go to a 20-something, a 15-year-old, a 35, 38-year-old, and I say, listen, on September, when we start talking about the prophecies, this is what the Bible says is going to happen. Uh, but but and that's, this, this, this is it. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Just believe it. Have faith. Believe it. Well, it might not work. You, you, you might be saying the truth, but it's not working with that person. If you go to a baby boomer, generally speaking, and you tell him, you know, she says, but why do you believe in Jesus? And you say, well, because it feels so good. I feel it in my heart. Every day when I wake up, I have this feeling that somebody is with me. Can you prove that to me? It doesn't speak my language. Can you prove that to me? We need to know who we are talking to. And that means that we don't say, okay, once a year or once every second year or once every third year, we are going to have an evangelistic meeting. When we go, we have four, five, six weeks all condensed, talking about prophecy, and we go and we bring as many people as we want. We have no idea where they come from. We have no idea of what goes without being said in their culture, and we just expect for them to listen to a message and at the end of it say, oh yes, I believe that. Some might. But what about we truly have meaningful relationships with our neighbors. And we love them because they are what? Human beings. And because they love, I mean, they live next door and we are a community oriented race, the human race. Amazing human race getting there. We, we, we are a community. We want to be with with, with other people. Not just because we have an agenda that we have in our hands and we have to meet a quota by a certain date. When we have the Bible like this as an agenda it becomes a hammer. When we have the Bible in our hearts, when we drink from the Bible every day, when we drink from Jesus every day, when we breathe from the Bible every day, we don't use it as a hammer, it's just within us. So we will automatically have relationships with our neighbors because we love them. And it will happen that out of the abundance of the heart speaks the mouth. Not because September, I forgot the date, but in September we have these meetings, so oh, that means that for the next two weeks, I'm going to be nice to my neighbor because I know that the flight is going to arrive in their mailbox. It's 
Go to First Peter, chapter three, verse fifteen. First Peter, chapter three, verse fifteen. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. The other version says, with gentleness and respect. You see, it says, to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. It's in you. It's within you. You're breathing it. You love it. You love God. You cannot stop talking about that. And I say, well, so what makes you all this? Why are you this way? Why, what's going on with you? It comes automatically, naturally from us. It's not an agenda. And what happens that way, because we have a relationship with our neighbor, because we know them, not because we want to invite them to church or because we want them to convert, but because we know them, because we do barbecue with them, because we play with the children, then we will know their culture. We will know where they are coming from. We will know what goes be, be what goes without being said. And that will be a conversation that involves gentleness and respect. My prayer. is that as uh, Paul says the knowledge of the Bible doesn't puff us up but we let the love edify the relationship with our neighbors love them above all and they will listen
Jesus, please come soon. Amen.